right. just for like. But you can save so much in babysitting. Yeah, it's like it would be, well, yeah, and, and have just some sort of backup. Yeah. Okay, yep, yes, sir. Here you go. I, I do. All right. All right. Everybody pull on in and we're going to get started with our core content track. All right. Uh, well, so it, it is uh, it is with great, can you guys hear me now in the back? How are you doing back there? Still no? No? More? Are we doing better? Is that better? Turn it to 11. OK, that's uh, the stuff I got. Is that better? Yeah? All right, cool. Hey, um, we're, let's get started on this uh, next talk. We have uh, Jeff Nunn uh, coming to talk to us on the best uh, infrastructure is the one that doesn't exist, building serverless, serverless uh, apps. And um, I just found out Jeff is from Dallas, so I gave him the strict warning that we give everybody from Dallas is, don't Dallas my Austin. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's good. All right, and do you have any other stuff? And we'll bring Jeff up. Uh, no, except serverless apps. It's almost like I knew this was coming when I, when I gave my presentation. So, uh, everybody, Jeff Nutt. Thank you. Uh, you were supposed to mention we played basketball together. We were sinners. We, I started, and he, he came in after me when I got hurt. But yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, well, thanks for being here. First of all, before we get this kicked off, I want to say a quick thanks to uh, Proxy, Travis, Lee, that team. This is the AV team that never get thanked, so everyone give them a round of applause. You normally only notice them when something goes wrong, so hopefully everything's good. But thanks, guys. Uh, all right, yeah, so Ernest is right. This is uh, a talk you saw coming. That, there's actually a deep dive of building this from, uh, I believe his uh, Rackspace is going to give a talk on a deeper dive on this, so I encourage you to attend that one. That'd be great, too. Um, my name is Jeff. I work for Amazon Web Services. I've uh, been there about a year and a half. I'm a solutions architect, uh, so that does give me a chance to do a lot of DevOps. I have to, uh, I'm a developer before this, so I have the, the dev uh, experience, but now I'm getting a lot of ops experience, and Ernest mentioned uh, infrastructure as code, maybe his blog did, but you guys all have familiarity with that. Um, so I'm really excited to be here. I'd like to see who here came from out of town. I think I saw a show of hands this morning. Nice. So one thing we're going to talk about today is ride-sharing apps. So who here took Uber this morning? Lyft? No Lyft. Is Lyft even in Austin? Okay. And I thought it was going to be really clever when I was building this talk out. I said, okay, guys, we're going to build a new, uh, this new experimental ride-sharing. We're going to have pedicabs. We're going to ride-share pedicabs. Then I did a little research, and I saw that they were at South By. So I missed that boat. Of course, it's already been invented. So we'll come up with another one. I promise you it'll be more unique uh, than pedicabs even. But when I was thinking about this, I was thinking about how much infrastructure goes into those ride-sharing apps. And I can tell you I don't know how they built it out. So for the sake of this talk, we'll imagine that I know everything about how they did it. And we're going to make a lot of assumptions, most of which will probably not be true. But you can imagine that they would be with me. Uh, so if you think about it, it all starts with the mobile part, right? So there's a mobile app. Oh, can we get the slides up? Sorry. They're up. Perfect. Uh, the mobile part, right? So there's a mobile app. You can make a request. And what happens with that request? That request immediately goes out. You get a pretty quick response. So we can imagine that there's probably some sort of API gateway, maybe a fleet of servers that are handling all these incoming requests. And again, we're imagining that this is all on premises. There are a lot of servers. You have to over provision in case there are events like South by or or uh, Austin City Limits Festival, whatever it might be, to handle all of that traffic. Um, there might be another fleet of servers, and this cluster might do algorithms for matching a requester with a rider or a driver. So we have an algorithm that looks, if I've given this guy on Uber a two-star rating before, which I've never done, by the way, that's terrible. If you give someone a two-star rating, maybe you don't get matched up with them again, so it finds the next nearest available and the next and on and on. But that is probably another set of infrastructure to maintain. And I should ask before we get too deep, is anyone here from Uber? Lyft, OK. Um, and to do all of that, there's, of course, a database. Maybe it's a cluster of some sort behind the scenes, right? Maybe it's a, a, a Cassandra cluster. Maybe it's Hadoop running all of this data and doing all this matching and algorithms. But again, I've had to manage a Hadoop cluster before. It's not easy. I'm sure a lot of you have done the same and are probably still doing it. Um, and finally, at the end, 
We get the match. We're sent to the driver, and the driver comes and picks us up. But it doesn't stop there, because what happens during that drive? A lot of analytics. There are callbacks to servers, so there's more servers taking callbacks, logging data, where are you, where are you heading, um, what's the traffic like, a lot of things happening behind the scenes, and again, it's another set of servers to do all of that. And finally, at the end, the ride is complete, everything is kind of finalized in the database, then there is the back office part. There's uh, analytics that they'd want to look at. Um, there would be payment processing. All of these things, all of these things server-based, um, and including things like an email server maybe to send an email notification, to send a text message out and say your ride is complete, please rate our driver. So I hope I'm painting the picture that this is a very complex setup, but we're gonna try to reproduce that because I need your help. So imagine now all of us are a part of the same consultancy, every one of us. A lot of very talented DevOps people here. Uh, if you read Ernest's blog, you also know DevOps incorporates uh, product, and QA, marketing. So in this crowd too, we have some very brilliant marketers. And what's happened now is the old yellow cab company has come to us and said, hey, we need help. There's these very disruptive services here in town. They are putting a hurt on our business. What can we do to to keep up, to catch up. And so our product team and our marketing team got together and they came up with a very polarizing idea, at least polarizing for 2016. If you're watching this in the future, who knows what's gonna happen. But they thought, why don't we combine the most polarizing thing we can with taxi cabs? And so our product team has built giant injection molded Trump wigs that we will put on top of yellow cabs and we're gonna call our company Truber. We're gonna rebrand yellow taxis to be Truber. Now, why are we gonna do this? We wanna make taxis great again. <laughs> we wanna do it in a serverless fashion. All right, so we're gonna take all of the infrastructure we laid out, we're gonna make it serverless now. So what does serverless even mean? That's what everyone's mom probably says. Before I started Amazon, my mom told people that I worked on the internet. And now that I'm here, she tells people I work for Amazon, which leads them to, do you package my boxes every day? And I just go with it and say yes. I'm gonna get the brown UPS shirt and no more questions. So I had to think about this. What does serverless mean? So does anyone wanna yell out anything? What does it mean to you? I'm gonna pick, no servers, yes. I love it. And that's pretty much it. Like what defines a server? To me, it's something you can shell into, right? So I can SSH into a box. I can RDP into a box. If I can do that and start managing that box, to me, it's a server. Uh, anyone else? I think it's pretty good. Did you say it? I keep pointing at you, but you said it. Oh, perfect. All right, um, but why would we want to, okay? So what are the benefits of serverless? I think we know this, but we'll cover it anyway. Serverless, first of all, doesn't necessarily mean there are no servers. Obviously, there are servers, but we don't have to manage them. Let someone else do it. I should have given the disclaimer earlier. I do work for AWS, as you know. This is not an AWS commercial. So the things we talk about here, I will mention AWS products because I'm very familiar with them. But if uh, AWS isn't your favorite cloud flavor, that's no problem, we'll still be friends. And I'm sure that your uh, favorite cloud provider probably does this, and if they don't now, they will soon because this is uh, the, coming, the coming wave. All right, so serverless doesn't mean there's no servers, right? We all know that they exist, but it does help you do a few things. One, quicker time to market. So now we don't requisition servers. We don't have to wait uh, two months, a year, for a server to get racked and stacked we need more memory, we don't have to wait for uh, ops to put memory in. Again, we remember that fight that we talked about between dev and ops and engineering. Hopefully that goes away because serverless abstracts all of that for you. And there's cost saving potential. I won't get into that because it's, this is not a sales talk, but uh, services like Lambda, for example, charge by uh, sub, sub second, all right? Instead of hourly payment for a virtual server, you're paying sub second for functions that run in the cloud. So you can see how it starts to bring down costs and let you scale massively. So to me, there are two things uh, that are the peanut butter and jelly of serverless architecture. And that is Amazon API Gateway and AWS Lambda. And again, I'm gonna cover these at a very high level. If you wanna know more, there's a great talk later. Um, I'll hang out after the talk or I'll see you at lunch. Just come ask me, we'll talk about it. So I'll cover it uh, in general in case you don't know. API Gateway, this you can imagine as the front door, right? It's a REST, uh, a collection of REST endpoints you can build out. It's a front door for your applications giving you access to all your backend features. Not only that, you can link to uh, AWS services, you can link to third party services, you can link to Lambda and then let Lambda do things and go to the other services. Um, 
really good way to start building out APIs. Has anyone ever used or built out an API before and struggled with that? So one of the pain points of that is metering, right? So if you're doing it for your client and you want to be able to meter things, uh, you know, limit, rate limit, the calls they can make, very tough. Security is always an issue. Uh, versioning is always an issue. So API Gateway kind of extra uh, uh, extrapolates that and lets us do that. We'll use this in the demo today. And then there's Lambda. So Lambda, if you don't know, lets you run functions in the cloud is kind of the way I explain it to people. Um, Lambda automatically scales for you. So you can throw all sorts of traffic at Lambda and it scales for you. One of the classic examples, and I apologize if you've read this before, but uh, we always talk about it on our, on our documentation. So imagine you have an S3 bucket. S3 is our storage service. Drop a file in S3, Lambda listens for those changes and can automatically take that file and do something with it. So for example, we could have a, a picture uh, that gets dropped into a bucket, maybe uh, uh, Pinterest or someone that's on the platform can use this. Picture's dropped into a bucket, the picture can be made into thumbnails and stored into different buckets. That all happens now with Lambda. Whereas before, you could build it out in a uh, service-oriented manner. You could have queues that held the pictures and a fleet of servers that ate off the queue and then expanded the, the uh, servers if you had more traffic and shrunk them back down. And it was all great and it's still a very viable pattern. But now you can do that with Lambda and eliminate some of that headache. So we have the peanut butter and jelly. I also love, personally, peanut butter, banana, and fresh white bread jelly sandwiches. So I'm gonna add two more to that. And that's AWS DynamoDB and S3. So we've talked a little bit about S3. Uh, DynamoDB, no SQL database. I grew up a Mongo fan. I'm still a huge Mongo fan. Told you ran the Cassandra clusters. I've started incorporating DynamoDB now. All good tools. If you have a need for any of those, use it. I'm just gonna talk about DynamoDB today. Uh, DynamoDB gives you tunable writes and reads. So you can scale up as you need, scale down, and you're able to do all of that uh, really rapidly. And then S3, finally, very, very durable storage, 11 nines. I used to know the math, what that meant. I think it was one object loss every 10 million years or something, but smarter people in here have already done the calculations and can tell you that. Um, so let's look at the infrastructure for Truber now. All right, so we're gonna start off the same way. We have, instead of this fleet of servers or an API gateway built to handle incoming traffic, what are we gonna use? Amazon API gateway. And I'll show you this in a demo here in a moment. Um, instead of the algorithm to match, all we're gonna do is pass those requests into Lambda. Lambda will look at a table of available uh, Uber, or sorry, Truber cars, decide which one to send. We'll replace that here with Lambda. Our database obviously is going to be DynamoDB. And all along the way, we're, we're scaling. By the way, before we get too far away from Lambda, we have, as you probably know, Java, Node.js, Python. And one thing we do at Amazon is we always, we really do look for your feedback on what you wanna see next. So I'd love to see or hear any languages you wanna see next in Lambda. I will take it back to the team and let them know. I may lie a little bit about how many people are here. I may say a few thousand. So we'll get higher on the list. Anyone else? Go, Ruby. Ruby. Ruby, all right. Cool, all right. And we're gonna keep, uh, we're not gonna keep the car actually. We're gonna get rid of that. <coughs> Excuse me, with a Truber car. Now our analytics cluster, we could keep that. We can still run Hadoop if we wanted. Um, I will show you how we can do it with Lambda as well though. So Lambda can run analytics and data and crunch everything it needs to out of DynamoDB. And then we can send that, we can send emails based off of that or based off of the end of the ride, for example, send an email to, to finalize the trip. And we'll do that with Amazon simple email service. So the way we can use Lambda for analytics is by using S3. So if you don't know, S3 can also host static websites. A static website doesn't have to be just a flat page, right? Uh, you can use Angular, you can use any JavaScript library. It just means you can't have a server-side library running in uh, S3, excuse me. We've actually used this to build very sophisticated dashboards in S3, hosted in S3. You can point a load balancer at it, you can have a custom domain name, and it's all served from S3. But that leads me to one more point. And that is there are very, very good analytics tools. There are very good dashboards. And the point is, you don't have to replace everything. Just because serverless is cool, and I love it, and I'm trying to move my things to it, there are times when you don't have to do it, and you shouldn't do it. Um, until the tooling gets there, until there are really great solutions that are serverless, use uh, people like Tableau or, or MicroStrategy. Use uh, services that you know and love and that you're able to configure. And in most cases, you don't have to manage those either. 
All right, so I thought I'd show a quick demo of um, how this works. So let's switch here. We can. Do I need to reshare? I'll stop the presentation. That'll probably work. <coughs> um, maybe if I stop PowerPoint. Sorry, guys. All right. So here we have API Gateway. Let me blow this up a little bit. All right, API Gateway. I've already taken the liberty of doing this in the, uh, in the interest of time, but I'll show you how this works. Anyone familiar with API Gateway yet? Okay, good number. Uh, so the way it works, very simple. We're gonna make two REST endpoints. First of all, we have a resource, and all a resource is is a resource, like a user or a vehicle. In this case, we have a trip resource. Typically, a resource will map to a model or a database table, something like that. We have a trip resource, and I have one method here called request, and it's a post method. So now I can accept uh, incoming traffic to trip slash request. And this post request is integrated with Lambda. Can everyone see that okay in the back? Let me blow it up a little more. I can also do a, a proxy. I could do an advanced service proxy, so I could pick a region. I could pick any of our services and actually send that traffic into those. So if I had EC2 running, for example, or, uh, or Firehose, I could send data directly into Firehose. For now, though, we'll just do a Lambda function. And this Lambda function is going to a function called request ride. So let me show you request ride. I have two functions. Remember, request ride is what takes the, uh, the mobile push, accepts the traffic, and does the algorithm to find a user. I'll show you my horrible node code. Please don't make fun of it. But the code is pretty simple. It's 100-ish lines. And all it's doing is looking through a, a table called Cooper Fleet. It's looking to see what vehicles are available. Of course, it's not going to be very complex here. You could do as complex as you want. But for the demo, I made it just find a random available vehicle. And I'll show you that table. So the table trooper fleet is just seeded with uh, some fake data, and the fake data looks like this. Just a vehicle ID, uh, type of auto, if it's available or not, a user ID, things like that. All right, so we're all familiar with what's happening here. API request comes in, sends it to Lambda. Lambda runs some node. It's going to find a vehicle. So we're going to try this out. And I'll show you here before we get too far that in the request table, we have nothing here. But as soon as I request a vehicle, we should see something. So we'll open the uh, iOS simulator. Make this a little bigger for you. There we go. All right, so we have Truber. Uh, we are here near uh, UT. We're gonna hit request pickup. All right, so a little debug information that says I dispatched a vehicle. It gives me a vehicle ID, it's a GUID. And then our request ID, so this 563F, let's make sure that's in our table now. So in Trooper request, we do have that, which is great. And here's the data. So we have an origin point, we have requested at. Again, this all came from the app, right? And the, the user ID is, has a, it's a guest ID. I'm gonna copy this request ID, we'll need it in a moment. So let's go back to API Gateway. So now we're, we're in the car, we're in the Trooper, we're driving across Austin. At the end of the ride, the driver has an app, and the driver is able to finalize the ride. So we have another endpoint. So it would be trip slash ID slash finalize. In this case, it's another post going to Lambda. Lambda is calling finalize trip. So just the other function, finalize trip. I'll show you the code there. Really simple code. Again, it's looking, uh, looking at the request table. It's getting the ID so it kind of knows the record, has the record that it needs. Again, all this without servers. I've hard-coded a destination for us for now. And let's see what happens. So to simulate this, we will um, we'll do a little curl. So the driver is going to do a uh, post request. And let me get the, all right, let's get the endpoint. So when you make it a, a, an API uh, gateway um, set, you should look at using Swagger. There's a really good talk later I've mentioned, and he talks about using Swagger. Swagger is an import-export 
uh, API formation tool. So we've talked about infrastructure as code. This is where you might start integrating some DevOps into this. So check in your code for your whole API, let other developers work on it, working as a team. Here's the endpoint for the API. So we'll paste that there on this trip slash ID slash finalize. All right, so there's our trip. Let's go make sure it's in DynamoDB. So I can go to the trip table, which was empty, and now it's got a record for us. So we have our destination, the distance, how long it took, the, the fare, et cetera, on and on. All right. The demo gods were kind to us. This doesn't happen always. So again, you don't have to replace everything, right? There are analytics pieces you don't have to replace. Hadoop cluster is, is tough to replace. If you're running Spark for massive queries, it's gonna be tough to replace right now. Hopefully you can do it with an abstracted service. Um, we do have a team right now working on a Lambda-based MapReduce. And it's just an internal blog post they're writing, but Lambda-based MapReduce. So it's taking data out of Redshift, which is a big uh, data warehouse, and running MapReduce jobs on that. Now, just because you do serverless doesn't mean you can't do DevOps. So let's look at a little example here. And this example uh, is a real example that gets used. We have uh, S3 set up to receive PDFs. It's a document management system. A PDF can be dropped into S3. Immediately, that event is sent to Lambda. Lambda can analyze the uh, PDF document, pull out metadata, write to a DynamoDB table, which is all pretty straightforward. The DevOps piece comes here. And developers work on the code, so it's Java code. They're able to uh, take that code, uh, run it through uh, Maven and Jenkins. So basically, Jenkins can run the test. If everything is, uh, passes, goes smoothly, Jenkins automatically fires off a script that pushes it up to Lambda. So now instead of having to manage that yourself, you've got uh, your DevOps processes in place to use tools that you're already familiar with. And the final thing to consider is watch out for sprawl. So we're in the early stages of serverless and developing and building for serverless which means there's a lot of tools and a lot of moving parts. Be very cautious of how, how you use them because you don't want to break the processes you're used to. You want to adapt those processes or adapt the workflow to yours. Uh, I'm going to pitch this company. This, they're not uh, associated with AWS. They run on AWS, but they are, have done a great work. Did, does anyone know the JAWS framework? No, it's serverless. Okay, it's a really good framework for doing serverless. So they take away a lot of the things I've shown you as far as building out the APIs, uh, by hand or even using Swagger. They kind of let you do everything all at once. A really nice framework for building out serverless. Uh, they also give you the ability to test Lambda locally. So that was a kind of an issue at first when people started adopting Lambdas. Hey, this is great. I love testing my, or building code in the cloud, but testing it's kind of a pain. Um, there are tools to help you with that now. And the, the bigger story is there are going to be more and more tools as time goes on. So keep up with those and look for, for good uh, projects like serverless. I have a link to uh, their, their GitHub repo at the end of this talk. So my, uh, my opening uh, title was very long. I kind of stole it from our CTO, Verners, and this is a really good quote. I, I love this one, but no server is easier to manage than no server. So I hope you keep that in mind as you start to uh, you know, explore this. Please keep an eye on the, uh, the deep dive later. Um, any of the, there's a great uh, service-oriented architecture, microservices talk, but you can start to see how these, all these subjects will start kind of uh, intertwining in with serverless. With that, thank you very much. I've got time for questions, if there's any questions. Any questions? Questions, I'll bring the mic around to you. Got one in the back. I love JSON, it's really cool, um, but not everything speaks JSON, there's a lot of old stuff out there. Are we making any progress on the API gateway exposing uh, native XML without transforms? Without transforms. Um, so there's a, there, so he's right, there is a, uh, there's a transformation process that you can do in API gateway. So I didn't show you, but in the, uh, in the trip request, when I passed in the request ID, I had to transform it to JSON in order for Lambda to work with it. And Lambda could have worked with it uh, another format, but that's the format I like too. I don't know about the roadmap on, on that part, uh, but I can look that up, and if it's uh, public, I'll share it with you. Yeah. We'll do that. We'll yeah. Good, good streamline it for a few minutes. Okay, yep. Thanks, good question. So what's the timeline for Go? 
timeline for Go, I know they are looking at it hard. Uh, they don't give us a timeline on that either, but Go, I would imagine, is very, very top of their list. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we hear, uh, so I was at a conference, uh, an internal conference we had, and our developers want Go as much as anyone else, so it's a good sign. Anyone else? This gentleman first. Right, so uh, this, is, this is the first I've seen of AWS Lambda, but it to me it seems like it's something like, uh, you know, so-called platform as a service industry. Is, is that what it is, or is it something different? I mean, it's different. I mean, you can, you can use it to build a platform as a service, uh, but think of it as running a function, just a function in the cloud. So take a function that you can run in response to events. An event could be adding a database entry, or it could be, uh, you know, dropping a picture in a bucket. Any event that you can think of on AWS, you can uh, route to a Lambda function. So another classic example would be when my server reaches 60% uh, CPU, I want to do something. I either want to spin up a new one or maybe I'll send off an alert. Lambda can be you know, triggered to do those things as well. Does that answer your question? We can talk more too afterwards if you'd like. Yeah, so it's my understanding that um, AWS is recommending you use CloudFormation templates to manage all this. Uh, but I've been struggling to use that and then like to do something like a blue green deployment with you know with like versioning and stuff like that I wonder if you could you know, touch on that so are you talking about uh, cloud formation for lambda and for API yeah for lambda and the yep. API uh, we like cloud formation because it is infrastructure as code so it kind of fits into the DevOps model um, but just like we say with everything else if you're comfortable with another way to do it you can do that he mentioned versioning and uh, what was the other uh, blue green deployment so we, we have versioning on both API Gateway and Lambda. So you can have a prod version or a staging version. You can have different versions of the same Lambda function. So maybe in the, the contrived example of, of uh, making thumbnails for images, maybe one of them makes a giant thumbnail, one makes a tiny one. And you can just route traffic to that one to test. Uh, as far as blue-green, we have customers doing it already with, with API Gateway. So they're just able to reroute their request to a different uh, URL. It's uh, and we, we recently added API Gateway support to CloudFormation, so I think that's an evolving process. It'll get better. Uh, definitely look at Swagger, though. I, I've been using that a lot, so um, I'm actually going to look to talk later um, to get deeper on it. Good question. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. So Lambda execution model, as far as I can tell, is kind of like. Uh, I don't know exactly how they implement it, but it looks like they implement the back end using container in sort of way. Is there any thoughts of moving a step forward, like implementing a service uh, to execute a hosted container service? Basically, allow any hosted container service to be a hosted container to be executed as Lambda, so that you get rid of this supported Lambda layer. Right. That if you ever want to do something in a Lambda-like fashion, you just upload a container and it will just run. Yep. Definitely, uh, I've heard that before, so I know it's on the roadmap. I don't know when that's coming, though. Okay. So uh, have you looked at the ECS, the container service we have? Uh, yes, okay. but, but you still have the host right. stuff. It, but he, he did remind me of one thing I forgot to mention, too, as far as language choice. So if you, know, you, you have Java, Node, and Python, which one do you use? I can tell you some best, best uh, practices for that. So, Java is the, the one that takes the longest to do a cold start. So if you don't know Lambda, when it runs a function, we kind of reserve the instance that it ran on just for a little bit to make sure you're not going to have more. So, and Java's great then. But if you need something fast at the beginning, Java's the cold start uh, leader. And Python is the one that starts up the fastest. So just keep those in mind whenever you're uh, developing your Lambda function. All right. Thanks, Arne. Or maybe, maybe one more. <laughs> I'm going to make you walk a long way. Is there a way to uh, synchronize uh, the execution of multiple lambdas, multiple instances of the same lambda? Oh, so you, wanna, you want to uh, invoke the same lambda function multiple times at once? That's correct. Is there a way to uh, control the synchronization of this? That's a good question. I don't know. Um, let's talk more about that, because I'm not sure. I know we do lambda, lambda fan out, so lambda calling other lambda functions. 
to do that a lot, but I'm not sure the, uh, I mean, if you hit it at the same time, yes, but I'm not sure it can spawn itself at the exact same time. So let's talk about that. Okay. Someone here, a use case. Yeah, I, I'd assume you might be able to do that with uh, simple workflow, right? Maybe so, yep. I'd like to hear that use case, though. That's a good question. All right. All right, thank you very thank you. much. Jeff Dunn, everybody. All right, yeah, very exciting. I think, uh, I personally feel like Lend is one of those things where we're just kind of starting to get it, but it's actually the people that are out there using it, it drives a pretty <coughs> dramatically different model of, of uh, how you how you can create and deliver your applications. Uh, uh, a lot a lot less messing around. Like to the to the ECS thing, I, I just got done implementing a whole kind of you know Amazon ECA, ECS based container. You know, Django web site sort of thing, and uh, yeah, you do a lot of part around, right? Like you know, setting up the ECS cluster, getting all the containers going, and a lot of apps out there, especially a lot of enterprise apps, like are pretty trivial, right? Like a, a lot of the applications that get written inside of enterprise really have about this much real logic to them. If I can take that report from over here and do something stupid to it, done, right? Like, you know, you end up writing a lot of apps like that. Uh, Lambda is a perfect solution for that. Why, why, why mess with your IT department and get them to get you a server and go through their weird governance hassles and all that when it's really just this much code you can run as a Lambda? All right, uh, next up we have. Sweet. All right, next up we have a 15 minute break. And uh, let's see, we will, in here we'll have 10 questions you should answer before building the new microservice. Um, in the Centennial Room at 1055, they'll be skating on thin ice with uh, Matt Johansson and uh, Community, the Secret Ingredient for DevOps uh, with Nathan Harvey in the Centennial Room. So That's right. All the, all the schedule is on uh, sked.org. Uh, and are you using the little app or just the website? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So DevOps Days Austin 2016.sked.org. Yeah, if you go to the DevOps Days Austin website, there will be a link to the sked, and it's, it's all nice. Um, please use your uh, use your break to go down and see our uh, vendors and stuff like that. If you planned on attending the hackathon, you're late. You should go uh, go down there and get in on the hackathon. Uh, thank you very much. All right. <laughs>